Culture, Essay 4 of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Culture. Can rules or tutors educate the semi-god whom we await? We must be musical, tremulous, impressional, alive to gentle influence of landscape and of sky, and tender to the spirit touch of man or maiden's eye, but to his native center fast shall into future fuse the past, and the world's flowing fates in his world mold recast. The word of ambition at the present day is culture. Whilst all the world is in pursuit of power, and of wealth as a means of power, culture corrects the theory of success. A man is the prisoner of his power. A topical memory makes him an almanac, a talent for debate, a disputant. Skill to get money makes him a miser, that is, a beggar. Culture reduces these inflammations by invoking the aid of other powers against the dominant talent, and by appealing to the rank of powers. It watches success. For performance, nature has no mercy, and sacrifices the performer to get it done. It makes a dopsy or a tympany of him. If she wants a thumb, she makes one at the cost of arms and legs, and any excess of power in one part is usually paid for by some defect in a contiguous part. Our efficiency depends so much on our concentration that nature usually in the instances where a marked man is sent onto the world overloads him with a bias, sacrificing his symmetry to his working power. It is said, no man can write but one book, and if a man have a defect, it is apt to leave its impression on all its performances. If she creates a policeman like Fouché, he is made up of suspicions and of plots to circumvent them. The air, said Fouché, is full of poniards. The physician Sanctorius spent his life in a pair of scales weighing his food. Lord Coke valued Chaucer highly, because of the canon Yemen's tale that illustrates the statute Henry V, chapter 4, against alchemy. I saw a man who believed the principal mistress of the English state were derived from the devotion to musical concerts. A Freemason, not long since, set out to explain to this country that the principal cause of the success of General Washington was the aid he derived from the Freemasons. But worse than harping on one string, nature has secured individualism by giving the private person a high conceit of his way in the system. The pest of society is egotists. They are dull and bright, sacred and profane, coarse and fine egotists. Tis a disease like influenza falls on all constitutions. In the distemper known to physicians as chorea, the patient sometimes turns around and continues to spin slowly in one spot. Is egotism a metaphysical varioloid of this malady? The man runs round a ring formed by his own talent, falls into admiration of it, and loses relation to the world. It is a tendency in all minds. One of its knowing forms is a craving for sympathy. The sufferers parade their miseries, tear the lint from the bruises, reveal their indictable crimes, that you may pity them. They like sickness, because physical pain will extort some show of interest from the bystanders, as we have seen children who, finding themselves of no account when grown-ups come in, will cough till they choke to draw attention. This distemper is the scourge of talent, of artists, inventors, and philosophers. Eminent spiritualists shall have an incapacity of putting their act or word aloof from them, and seeing it bravely for the nothing it is. Beware of the man who says, I am on the eve of a revelation. It is speedily punished, inasmuch as this habit invites men to humor it, and by treating the patient tenderly, to shut him up in narrow selfism, and exclude him from the great works of God's cheerful, fallible men and women. Let's rather be insulted while we are insultable. Religious literature has eminent examples, and if we run over our private list of poets, critics, philanthropists, and philosophers, we shall find them infected with this dropsy and elephantiasis, which we ought to have tapped. This goiter of egotism is so frequent among notable persons that we must infer some strong necessity in nature which it subserves, such as we see in the sexual attraction. The preservation of the species was a point of such necessity that nature has secured it at all hazards by immensely overloading the passion, at the risk of perpetual crime and disorder. So egotism has its root in the cardinal necessity by which each individual persists to be what he is. This individuality is not only not inconsistent with culture, but is the basis of it. Every valuable nature is there in its own right, and the student we speak to must have a mother wit invincible by his culture, which uses all books, arts, facilities, and elegance of intercourse, but is never subdued and lost in them. He only is a well-made man who has a good determination, and the end of all culture is not to destroy this, God forbid, but to train away all impediment and mixture, and leave nothing but power. Our student must have a style and determination, and be a master of his own specialty. But having this, he must put it behind him. 
He must have a catholicity, a power to see with a free and disengaged look every object. Yet is his private interest in self so overcharged that, if a man seek a companion who can look at an object for their own sake and without affectation or self-reference, he will find the fewest who will give him that satisfaction. Whilst most men are afflicted with a coldness and curiosity as soon as any object does not connect with their self-love. Though they talk of the object before them, they are thinking of themselves, and their vanity is laying little traps for your admiration. But after a man has discovered that there are limits to the interest which his private history has for mankind, he still converses with his family, or a few companions, perhaps with a half-dozen personalities that are famous in his neighborhood. In Boston, the question of life is the names of some eight or ten men. Have you seen Mr. Allison, Dr. Channing, Mr. Adams, Mr. Webster, and Mr. Greenbow? Have you heard Everett, Garrison, Father Taylor, Theodore Parker? Have you talked with Monsieur Turbinwheel, Summit Level, and La Crofopoe? Then you may as well die. In New York, the question is some eight or ten or twenty. Have you seen a few lawyers, merchants, and brokers? Two or three scholars? Two or three capitalists? Two or three editors of newspapers? New York is a sucked orange. All conversation is at an end when you have discharged ourselves of a dozen personalities, domestic or imported, which make up our American existence. Nor do we expect anybody to be other than a faint copy of these heroes. Life is very narrow. Bring any club or company of intelligent men together after ten years, and if the presence of some penetrating and calming genius could dispose them to frankness, what a confession of insanities would come up. The causes which we have sacrificed, terror for democracy, whiggism or abolition, temperance to socialism, would show like roots of bitterness and dragon's wrath. And our talents are as mischievous as if they had been seized upon by some bird of prey, which had whisked him away from fortune, from truth, from the dear society of the poets, some zeal, some bias, and only when he is now gray and nerveless, was it relaxing its claws, and he awakening to sober perceptions. Culture is the suggestion from certain best thoughts that a man has a range of affinities, through which he can modulate the violence of any master tones that have a droning preponderance on a scale, and succor him against himself. Culture redresses his balance, puts him among his equals and superiors, revives a delicious sense of sympathy, and warns him of the danger of solitude and repulsion. It is not a compliment but a disparagement to consult a man only on horses, or on steam, or on theatres, or on, on eating, or on books, and, whenever he appears, considerately to turn the conversation to the bantling he is known to fondle. In the Norse heaven of our forefathers, Thor's house had five hundred and forty floors. A man's house has five hundred and forty floors. His excellence is facility of adaption and of transition through many related points, to wide contrasts and extremes. Culture kills his exaggeration, his conceit of his village or his city. We must leave our pets at home when we go into the street and meet men on broad grounds of good meaning and good sense. No performance is worth loss of geniality. It is a cruel price we pay for certain fancy goods called fine art and philosophy. In the Norse legend, Alfader did not get a drink from Mimir's spring, the fountain of wisdom, until he left his eye in pledge. And here is a pedant that cannot unfold his wrinkles, nor conceal his wrath at interruption by the best, if their conversation not fit his impertinency. Here is a he to afflict us with his personalities. Tis incident to scholars that each of them fancies he is pointedly odious in his community. Draw him out of his limbo of irritability. Cleanse with healthy blood his parchment skin. You restore to him the eye which he left in pledge of Mimir's spring. If you are the victim of your doing, who cares what you do? We can spare your opera, your gazetteer, your chemic analysis, your history, your syllogisms. Your man of genius pays dear for his distinction. His head runs into a spire, and instead of a healthy man, merry and wise, he is some mad dominee. Nature is reckless of the individual. When she has points to carry, she carries them. To wade in marshes and sea margins is the destiny of certain birds, and they are so accurately made for this that they are imprisoned in those places. Each animal out of its habitat would starve. To the physician, each man, each woman, is an application of one organ. A soldier, a locksmith, a bank clerk, and a dancer cannot exchange functions, and thus we are victims of our adaptation. The antidotes against this organic egotism are the range and variety of attractions, as gained by acquaintance with the world, with men of merit, with classes of society, with travel, with eminent persons, and with the high resources of philosophy, art, and religion. Books, travel, society, solitude. The hardiest skeptic who has ever seen a horse broken, a pointer trained, or has visited a menagerie, or the exhibition of the industrious fleas, will not deny the validity of education. A boy, said Plato, is the most vicious of all wild beasts. In the same spirit, the old English poet Gascon said, A boy is better unborn than untaught. The city breeds one kind of speech and manners, the back country a different style, the sea another, the army a fourth. We know that an army which can be confided in may be formed by discipline, that by systematic discipline all men may be made heroes. 
Marshal Lane said to the French officer, No, Colonel, that none but a Peltroon would boast he never was afraid. A great part of courage is the courage of having done the thing before. And in all human action, those faculties will be strong which are used. Robert Owen said, Give me a tiger, and I won't educate him. Tis inhuman to want faith in the power of education, since to ameliorate is the law of nature. And men are valued precisely as they exert onward or ameliorating force. On the other hand, poltroonery is the acknowledging of an inferiority to be incurable. Incapacity or amelioration is the only mortal distemper. There are people who can never understand a trope, or any second or expended sense given to your words, or any humor, but remain literalist after hearing the music and poetry and rhetoric and wit of seventy or eighty years. They are past the help of surgeon or clergy. But even these can understand pitchforks and the cry of fire. I have noticed in some of this class a marked dislike of earthquakes. Let us make our education brave and preventative. Politics is an afterwork, a poor patching. We are always a little late. The evil is done. The law is passed. We begin the uphill agitation for repeal of that which we ought to have prevented the enacting. We shall one day learn to supersede politics by education. What we call our root and branch reforms of slavery, war, gambling, and temperance is only medicating the symptoms. We must begin higher up, namely, in education. Arts and tools give to him who can handle them much the same advantage over the novice, as if he extended his life ten, fifty, or a hundred years. And I think it the part of every good sense to provide every fine soul with such culture that it shall not, at thirty or forty years, have to say, this which I might do is made hopeless through my want of weapons. But it is conceded that much of our training fails of effect, that all success is hazardous and rare, that a large part of our costs and pains is thrown away. Nature takes the matter into her own hands, and, but we must not admit any jot of our system, we can seldom be sure that it has availed much, or that as much good would have not have accrued from a different system. Books, as containing the finest records of human wit, must always enter into our notion of culture. The best heads that ever existed, Pericles, Plato, Julius Caesar, Shakespeare, Goethe, Milton, were well-read, universally educated men, and quite too wise to undervalue letters. Their opinion has weight, because they had means of knowing the opposite opinion. We look that a great man should be a good reader, or in proportion to the spontaneous power should be the assimilating power. Good criticism is very rare and always precious. I am always happy to meet persons who perceive the transcendent superiority of Shakespeare over all writers. I like people who like Plato, because this love does not consist with self-conceit. But books are good only as far as a boy is ready for them. He sometimes gets ready very slowly. You send your child to schoolmaster, but to schoolboys who educate him. You send him to the Latin class, but much of his tuition comes on his way to school, from the shop windows. He likes the strict rules and long terms, but he finds his best leading in a byway of his own, and refuses any companions but of his choosing. He hates the grammar and greatest, and loves guns, fishing rods, horses, and boats. Well, the boy is right, and you are not fit to direct his upbringing, if your theory leaves out his gymnastic training. Archery, cricket, gun, and fishing rod, horse and bolt are all educators, liberalizers, and so are dancing, dress, and street talk. And, provided only the boy has resources, and is of noble and genius strain, these will not serve him less than the books. He learns chess, whist, dancing, and theatricals. The father observes that another boy has learned algebra and geometry in the same time. But the first boy has acquired much more than these poor games along with them. He is infatuated for weeks with whist and chess, but presently will find out, as you did, that when he rises from the game too long played, he is vacant and forlorn and despises himself. Thenceforth it takes place among other things, and has its due weight in its experience. These minor skills and accomplishments, for example, dancing, are tickets of admission to the dress circle of mankind, and the being master of them enables the youth to judge intelligently of such, on which otherwise he would have a pedantic squint. Landor said, I have suffered more from my bad dancing than from all the misfortunes and miseries of my life put together. Provided always the boy is teachable, for we are not proposing to make a statue out of punk. Football, cricket, archery, swimming, skating, climbing, fencing, dancing are lessons of the art of power, which it is his main business to learn. Riding, especially, of which Lord Herbert of Cherbury said, A good rider on a good horse is as much above himself and others as the world can make him. Besides, the gun, fishing rod, boat, and horse constitute, among those who use them, secret Freemasonries. They are as if they belong to one club. There is also a negative value in these arts. The chief use to the youth is not amusement, but to be known for what they are, and not to be remained to him occasions of heartburn. We are full of superstitions. Each class fixes its eyes on the advantages it has not, the refined on rude strength. The Democrat on birth and breeding. One of the benefits of a college education is to show the boy of its little avail. 
I knew a leading man in a leading city who, having set his heart on education at the university and missed it, could never quite feel himself the equal of his own brothers who had gone thither. His easy superiority to multitudes of professional men could never quite countervail him of this imaginary defect. Balls, riding, wine parties, and billiards passed to a poor boy for something fine and romantic, which they are not, and a free admission to them on equal footing, if it were possible, only once or twice, would be worth ten times its cost, by undeceiving him. I am not much an advocate for traveling, and I observe that men run away from their countries because they are not good in their own, or back to their own because they pass for nothing in the new places. For the most part, only the light characters travel. Or you that have no task to keep you at home. I have been quoted as saying captious things about travel, but I mean to do justice. I think there is a restlessness in our people, which argues want of character. All educated Americans, first or last, go to Europe perhaps because it is their mental home, as the invalid habits of this country might suggest. An eminent teacher of girls said, the idea of a girl's education is whatever qualifies them for going to Europe. Can we never extract this tapeworm of Europe from the brain of our countrymen? One sees very well what their fate must be. He that does not fill a place at home cannot abroad. He only goes there to hide his insignificance in a larger crowd. You do not think you will find anything there you wish you not see at home. The stuff of all countries is just the same. Do you suppose there is any country where they do not scald milk pans and swaddle the infants and burn the brushwood and broil the fish? What is true anywhere is true everywhere. I let him go where he will. He can only find so much beauty or worth as he carries. Of course, for some men, travel may be useful. Naturalists, discoverers, and sailors are born. Some men are made for couriers, exchangers, envoys, missionaries, bearers of dispatches, as others are for farmers or working men. If the man is of light and social turn, and nature has aimed to make a leg and wigged creature framed for locomotion, then we must follow his hint, and furnish him with that breeding which gives currency, as sedulously as with that which gives worth. But let us not be pedantic, but allow it to travel its full effect. The boy grown up on the farm, which he has never left, is said in the country to have had no chance, and boys and men of that condition look upon work on a railroad or drudgery in a city as opportunity. Poor country boys of Vermont, Connecticut, formerly owed that knowledge they had to the peddling trips of the southern states. California on the Pacific coast is now a university of this class, as Virginia was in old times. To have some chance is their word, and the phrase to know the world or to travel is synonymous with all men's ideas of advantage and superiority. No doubt, to a man of sense, travel offers advantages. As many languages as he has, as many friends, as many arts and trades, as many times as he a man. A foreign country is a point of comparison wherefrom to judge his own. One use of travel is to recommend the books and works of home, who go to Europe to be Americanized, and another to find men. For as nature has put fruits apart in latitudes, a new fruit in every degree, so knowledge and fine moral qualities she lodges in distant men. And thus, of the six or seven teachers whom each man wants among his contemporaries, it often happens that one or two of them live on the other side of the world. Moreover, there is in every constitution a certain solstice, where the stars stand still in our inward firmament, and when there is required some foreign force, some diversion or alternative to prevent stagnation. And as a medical remedy, travel seems to be one of the best. Just as a man witnessing the admirable effect of ether to little pain, and meditating on the contingencies of wounds, cancers, lockjaws, rejoices in Dr. Jackson's benign discovery, so a man who looks at Paris, at Naples, at London, says, If I should be driven from my own home, here at least, my, my thoughts can be consoled by the most prodigal amusements and occupation which the human race in ages could contrive and accumulate. Akin to the benefit of foreign travel, the aesthetic value of railroads is to unite the advantages in town of country life, neither of which we can spare. A man should live in or near a large town, because, let his own genius be what it may, it will repel quite as much of agreeable and valuable talent as it draws, and, in a city, a total attraction of all citizens is sure to conquer, first or last, every repulsion, and drag the most improbable hermit within its walls some day of the year. In town he can find the swimming pool, the gymnasium, the dancing master, the shooting gallery, opera, theater, and panorama the chemist shop, the museum of natural history, the gallery of fine arts, the national orders, in their turn, foreign travelers, the libraries, and his club. In the country he can find solitude in reading, manly labor, cheap living, and his old shoes, wars for games, hills for geology, and groves for devotion. Aubrey writes, I have heard Thomas Hobbes say that, in the Earl of Devon's house in Derbyshire, there was a good library and books enough for him, and his lordship stored the library with what books he thought fit to be bought. But the want of good conversation was a great inconvenience, and though he conceived he could order his thinking as well as another, yet he found a great defect. In the country, in a long time, 
for one of good conversation, one's understanding and invention contract a moss on them, like an old paling in an orchard. Cities give us collision. Tis said, London and New York take the nonsense out of a man. A great part of our education is sympathetic and social. Boys and girls who have been brought up in well-informed and superior people show in their manners an inestimable grace. Fuller said that William Earl of Nasa won a subject for the King of Spain every time he put off his hat. You cannot have one well-bred man without a whole society of such. They keep each other up to any high point, especially women. It requires a great many cultivated women, saloons of bright, elegant, reading women, accustomed to ease and refinement, to spectacles, pictures, sculpture, poetry, and to elegant society, in order that you should have one Madame de Stael. The head of a commercial house or a leading lawyer or politician is brought into daily contact with troops of men for all parts of the country, and those two have the driving wheels, the businessmen of each section, and one can hardly suggest for a more apprehensive man a more searching culture. Besides, we must remember the high social possibilities of a million of men. The best bribe which London offers today to the imagination is that, in such a vast variety of people and conditions, one can believe that there is room for persons of romantic character to exist, that the poet, the mystic, and the hero may hope to confront their counterparts. I wish cities could teach the best lesson of quiet manners. It is a foible, especially of American youth, pretension. The work of the man of the world is absence of pretension. He does not make a speech. He takes a low business tone, avoids all brag, as nobody, dresses plainly, promises not at all, performs much, speaks in monosyllables, hugs his facts. He calls his employment by his lowest name, and so takes from evil tongues their sharpest weapon. His conversation clings to weather in the news, yet he allows himself to be surprised in a thought, and the unlocking of his learning and philosophy. How the imagination is piqued by anecdotes of great men passing incognito as a king in gray clothes, of Napoleon affecting a plain suit at his glittering levy, of Burns, of Scott, of Beethoven, of Wellington, of Goethe, or any container of transcendent power passing for nobody of Apamenandas, who never says anything but will listen eternally, of Goethe, who preferred trifling subjects and common expressions in intercourse with strangers, worse rather than better clothes, and to appear a little more capricious than he was. There are advantages in the old hat and box coat. I have heard that, throughout this country, a certain respect is paid to good broadcloth, but dress makes a little restraint. Men will not commit themselves. But the box coat is like wine. It unlocks the tongue, and men say what they think. An old poet said, Go far and go sparing, and you'll find it certain. The poorer and the baser you appear, the more you look through still. Not much otherwise, Milnes writes, in the lay of the humble. To me, men are for what they are. They wear no masks with me. Tis out that a people should have, not water on the brain, but a little gas there. A shrewd foreigner said of the Americans that, whatever they say has a little the air of a speech. Yet one of the traits down in the books as distinguishing the Anglo-Saxon is the trick of self-disparagement. To be sure, in old dense countries, among a million of good coats, a fine coat comes to be of no distinction, and you find humorists. In an English party, a man with no marked manners for features, with a face like red dough, unexpectedly discloses wit, learning a wide range of topics, and personal familiarity with good men in all parts of the world, until you think you have fallen upon some illustrious personage. Can it be that the American forest has refreshed some weeds of old pietish barbarism just ready to die out? The love of the scarlet feather of beads and tinsel? The Italians are fond of red clothes, peacock plumes, and embroidery. And I remember one rainy morning in the city of Palermo. The street was in a blaze with scarlet umbrellas. The English have a plain taste. The equipages of the grandees are plain. A gorgeous livery indicates new and awkward city wealth. Mr. Pitt, like Mr. Pym, thought the title of Mr. Good against any king in Europe. They have piqued themselves on governing the whole world in a poor, plain, dark committee room, which the House of Commons sat in before the fire. Whilst we want cities as the centers where the best things are found, cities degrade us by magnifying trifles. The countrymen find the town a chop house, a barber shop. He has lost the lines of grandeur of the horizon, hills and plains, and with them sobriety and elevation. He has come among a supple, glib tongued tribe who live for show, servile to public opinion. Life is dragged down to a fracas of pitiful cares and disasters. You say the gods ought to respect a life whose objects are their own, but in cities they have betrayed you to a cloud of insignificant annoyances. Tis heavy odds against the gods when they will match with Myrmidons. We spawning, spawning Myrmidons, our turn today, we take command. Jove gives the clove into the hand of Myrmidons of Myrmidons. What is odious but noise, and people who scream and bewail, people whose vein point always east, who live to dine, who send for the doctor, who coddle themselves, who toast their feet on the register, who intrigue to secure a padded chair and a corner out of the drought. Suffer them once to begin the enumeration of their infirmities, and the sun will not go down on an unfinished tale. 
Let these triflers put us out of conceit with petty comforts. To a man at work, the frost is but a color. The rain, the wind, he forgot them when he came in. Let us learn to live coarsely, dress plainly, and lie hard. The least habit of dominion over the palate has certain good effects not easily estimated. Neither will we be driven into a quiddling abstemiousness. Tis a superstition to insist on a special diet. All is made at last of the same chemical atoms. A man in pursuit of greatness feels no little wants. How can you mind diet, bed, dress, or salads of compliments, or the figure you make in company or wealth, or even the bringing things to pass, when you think how paltry are the machinery of the workers? Wordsworth was praised to me, in a western moorland, for having afforded to his country neighbors an example of modest household, where comfort and culture were secured without display, and a tender boy who wears his rusty cap and outgrown coat, that he may secure the coveted place in college, and the right in the library, is educated to some purpose. There is a great deal of self-denial and manliness in poor and middle-class houses, in town and country, that has not got into literature, and never will, but that keeps the earth sweet that saves on superfluities and spends on essentials, that goes rusty and educates the boy, that sells the horse and builds the school, works early and late, takes two looms in the factory, three looms, six looms, and pays off the mortgage on the paternal farm, and then goes back cheerfully to work again. We can ill spare the commanding social benefits of cities. They must be used, yet cautiously and haughtily, and will yield their best values to him who best can do without them. Keep the town for occasions, but the habit should be formed to retirement. Solitude, the safeguard of mediocrity, is to genius the stern friend, the cold obscure shelter, where molt the wings which will bear it farther than suns and stars. He who shall inspire and lead his race must be defended from traveling with the souls of other men, from living, breathing, reading, and writing in the daily, time-worn yoke of their opinions. In the morning, solitude, said Pythagoras. That nature may speak the imagination, as she never does in company, and that her favorite may make acquaintance with those divine strengths which disclose themselves to serious and abstracted thought. It is very certain that Plato, Plotinus, Archimedes, Hermes, Newton, Milton, Wordsworth did not live in a crowd, but descended into it from time to time as benefactors. And the wise instructor will press the point of securing to the young soul in the disposition of time and the arrangements of living periods and habits of solitude. The high advantage of university life is often the mere mechanical one, I may call it, of a separate chamber and fire, which parents will allow the boy without hesitation at Cambridge, but do not think needful at home. We say solitude, to mark the character of a tone of thought, but it can be shared between two or more than two. It is happier and not less noble. We four, wrote Neander to his sacred friends, will enjoy at hail the inward blessedness of Civitas Dia, whose foundations are forever friendship. The more I know you, the more I dissatisfy and must satisfy all my wanted companions. The very presence stupefies me. The common understanding withdraws itself from one center to all existence. Solitude takes off the pressure of present opportunities that more Catholic and humane relations may appear. The saint and poet seek privacy to ends the most public and universal, and it is the secret of culture to interest the man more in his public than in his private quality. Here is a new poem, which elicits a good many comments in the journals and in conversation. From these it is easy, at least, to eliminate the verdict which readers pass upon it, and that is, in the main, unfavorable. The poet, as a craftsman, is only interested in the praise accorded to him, and not in the censure, though it be just. And the poor little poet hearkens only to that, and rejects the censure, as proving incapacity in the critic. But the poet cultivated becomes a stockholder in both companies, say Mr. Curfew, in the curfew stock, in, and in the humanity stock, and the last time exalts as much in the demonstration of the unsoundness of curfew, as his interest in the former gives him pleasure in the currency of curfew. For the depreciation of his curfew stock only shows the immense value of the humanity stock. As soon as he sides with this critic against himself, with joy he is a cultivated man. We must have an intellectual quality in all property and all action, or they are not. I must have children, I must have events, I must have a social state and history, or my thinking and speaking want body or basis. But to give these accessories any value, I must know them as contingent and rather showy possessions, which pass for more to the people than to me. See this abstraction in scholars as a matter of course. But what a charm it adds when observed in practical men. Bonaparte, like Caesar, was intellectual, he could look at every object for itself without affectation. Though an egotist a la train, he would criticize a play, a building, a character, on universal grounds, and give a just opinion. A man known to us only as a celebrity in politics or in trade gains largely in our esteem if we discover he has some intellectual taste or skill. As when we learn of Lord Fairfax, the long Parliament's general, his passion for antiquarian studies, or the French regicide Charnot, 
his sublime genius in mathematics, or of a living banker, his success in poetry, or of a partisan journalist, his devotion to ornithology. So, if in traveling in the dreary wilderness to Arkansas or Texas, we should observe on the next seat a man reading Horace or Marshall or Calderon, we should wish to hug him. In callings that require roughest energy, soldiers, sea captains, and civil engineers sometimes betray a fine insight, if only through a certain gentleness when off duty, a good-natured admission that there are illusions, and who shall say that there is not their sport? We only vary the phrase, not the doctrine, when we say that culture opens the sense of beauty. A man is a beggar who only lives to the useful, and, however he may serve as a pin or rivet in the social machine, cannot be said to have arrived at self-possession. I suffer every day from the want of perception of beauty in people. They do not know the charm with which all moments and objects can be embellished, the charm of manners, the self-command of benevolence. Repose and cheerfulness are the badge of the gentleman. Repose in energy. The Greek battle pieces are calm. The heroes, in whatever violent action engaged, retain a serene aspect, as we say of Niagara, that it falls without speed. A cheerful, intelligent face is the end of culture, and success enough, for it indicates that the purpose of nature and wisdom attained. When our higher faculties are in activity, we are domesticated, and awkwardness and discomfort give place to natural and agreeable movements. It is noticed that the consideration of the great periods of space and astronomy induces a dignity of man and indifference to death. The influence of fine scenery, the presence of mountains, appease our irritations and elevates our friendship. Even a high dome and the expansive interior of a cathedral have a sensible effect on manners. I have heard that stiff people will lose something of their awkwardness under high ceilings and in spacious halls. I think sculpture and painting have an effect to teach us manners and abolish hurry. But overall, culture must reinforce from higher influx the empirical skills of eloquence, or of politics, or of trade, and the useful arts. There is a certain loftiness of thought, power to marshal and adjust particulars, which can only come from an insight of their whole connection. The orator who has once seen things in a divine order will never quite lose sight of this, and will come to affairs as from a higher ground. And though he will say nothing of philosophy, he will have a certain mastery in dealing with them, and an incapableness of being dazzled or frightened, which will distinguish his handling from that of attorneys and factors a man who stands on a good footing with the head of parties at washington reads the rumors of the newspapers and the guesses of provincial politicians with the key to the right and the wrong in each statement and sees well enough where all this will end our committees will look through your connecticut machine at a glance and judge of its fitness and much more a wise man who knows not only what plato but of st john can show him can easily raise the affairs he deals with to a certain majesty plato says pericles owed his elevation to lessons of anaxagoras Burke descended from a higher sphere than he would influence human affairs. Franklin, Adams, Jefferson, and Washington stood on a fine humanity, before which the brawls of modern senates are but pothouse politics. But there are higher secrets of culture, which are not for the apprentices, but for the proficients. They are lessons only for the brave. We must know our friends under ugly masks. The calamities are our friends. Ben Johnson specifies in his address to the muse get him the time's long grudge the court's ill will and reconcile keep him suspected still make him lose all his friends and what is worse almost always to any better course with me thou leavest a better muse than thee and which thou brought me blessed poverty I wish to learn philosophy by rote and play at heroism but the wiser god said take shame the poverty and the penal solitude and belong to true speaking try the rough water as well as the smooth rough water can teach lessons worth knowing when the state is unquiet personal qualities are more than ever decisive fear not a revolution which will constrain you to live five years in one don't be so tender at making an enemy now and then be willing to go to coventry sometimes and let the populace bestow on you their coldest contempts the finished man of the world must eat of every apple once he must hold his hatred also at arm's length and not remember spite he has neither friends nor enemies but values men only as channels of power he who aims high must dread an easy home and popular manners heaven sometimes hedges a rare character about with ungainliness and odium as a burr that protects the fruit if there is any great and good thing in store for you it will not come at the first or the second call but in the shape of fashion ease and city drawing-rooms popularity is for dolls steep and craggy said porphyry is the path of the gods open your marcus antonius in the opinion of the ancients he was a great man who scorned to shine and who contested the frowns of fortune they preferred the noble vessel too late for the tide, contending with winds and waves, dismantled and unrigged, to her companions borne into harbor with colors flying and guns firing. There is none of the social goods that may not be purchased too dear, and mere amiableness must not take rank with high aims and self-subsistency.
Betine replies to Greta's mother, who chides her disregard of dress. If I cannot do as I have in mind, in our poor Frankfurt, I should not carry things far. And the youth must rate at its true rank the inconceivable levity of local opinion. The longer we live, the more we must endure the elementary existence of men and women. And every brave heart must treat society as a child, and never allow it to dictate. All that class of the severe and restrictive virtues, said Burke, are almost too costly for humanity. Who wishes to be severe? Who wishes to resist the eminent and polite, in behalf of the poor and low and impolite? And who that dares do it, and can keep his temper sweet, is frolic spirits. The high virtues are not debonair, but have their redress in being illustrious at last. What forest of laurel we bring, and the tears of mankind to those who stood firm against the opinion of their contemporaries. The measure of a master is a success in bringing all men round to his opinion twenty years later. Let me say here that culture cannot begin too early. In talking with scholars, I observed that they lost on ruder companions those years of boyhood which alone could give imaginative literary religious and infinite quality in their esteem. I find, too, that the chance for appreciation is much increased by being the son of an appreciator, and that these boys who now grow up are caught not only years too late, but two or three births too late, to make the best scholars of. And I think it is presentable motive of a scholar that, as in an old community, a well-born proprietor is usually found, after the first heats of youth, to be a careful husband, and to feel a habitual desire that the estate shall suffer no harm by his administration, but shall be delivered down to the next heir, in a good condition as he received it, so a considerate man will reckon himself a subject to that secular amelioration by which mankind is mollified, cured, and refined, and will shun every expenditure of his forces on pleasure or gain, which will jeopardize the social and secular accumulation. The fossil strata show us that nature began with rudimentary forms, and rose to the more complex, as fast as the earth was fit for the dwelling place, and that the lower perish as the higher appear. Very few of our race can be said to be yet finished men. We still carry sticking in us some of the remains of the preceding inferior quadruped organization. We call these millions men, but they are not yet men. Half engaged in the soil, planning to get free, man needs all the music that can be brought to disengage him. If love, red love, with tears and joy, if want with his scourge, if war with his cannonade, if Christianity with his charity, if trade with its money, if art with his portfolios, if science with the telegraphs through the depths of space and time, can set his dull nerves throbbing, and by loud taps on the tough chrysalis break its walls, and let the new creature emerge erect and free, make way and sing pan. The age of the quadruped is to go out, the age of the brain and the heart is to come in. The time will come when the evil forms we have known can no more be organized. Man's culture can spare nothing, wants all the material. He is to convert all impediments into instruments, all enemies into power. The formidable mischief we only make the more useful slave. And if one shall read the future of the race hinted in the organic effort of nature to mount and ameliorate, and the corresponding impulse to the better in the human being, we shall dare affirm that there is nothing he will not overcome and convert, but alas, culture shall absorb the chaos and gehenna. He will convert the furies into muses, and the hells into benefit. End of Culture Recording by Daniel Christopher June Visit my website at perfectidios.com. It's perfect, I-D-I-U-S dot com.